We got another uh, quick announcement. Uh, immediately after Adrian's talk, there will be a party located uh, just to the right of the down escalator there. Uh, I, I mentioned before about student badges. Those will not be allowed entry, but every other badge will be attendees, speakers, staff, and so forth. So I just want to make that quick announcement. <clears throat> Give you guys a chance to file in here. Uh, to my right here, uh, Adrian Crenshaw, who also maintains IronGeek.com. Um, you know, I was going to read something off a piece of paper, but I don't think it, it's it's particularly necessary. Uh, if you're if you're not familiar with Adrian uh, in some way indirectly, you probably are because he's done so much media capture within our industry that you'll see you know videos not only on his site but YouTube channels as well. Uh, he's done a fantastic job of contributing not only with Iron Geek, but everything that he does. Uh, he's also one of the co-founders of DerbyCon as well. I uh, highly encourage you to attend that conference. And uh, Adrian, thanks for coming. Thank you very much. All right, am I coming through loud enough there? All right, let me put this back in its receptacle. Luckily, I do not move that much. Hello, everybody. The talk you're about to see is dropping docs on docnets, how people got caught. And I'm going to turn this off before I start blinding people. But OK, dropping doc, doc on docnets. I should have chose a title that doesn't, isn't exactly a tongue twister. But uh, we're going to talk about various cases of people getting de-anonymized on tour. First of all, a bit about me. I run irongeek.com, as he mentioned. I host a lot of videos from conferences I go to and um, also present at. I have an interest in InfoSec education. I don't know everything. I'm just a geek with time in my hands. I may get something wrong, so let me know if I do. I'm also a senior information security consultant at TrustedSec. So send us some love, send us some work. You know, I'm sure they would appreciate it since they let me have the time off to come to all these conferences and record. And I'm also a co-founder of DerbyCon. OK, general perspective and a few warnings here. Um, I'm going to be talking about these dark nets from two perspectives. One, people I'm trying to help stay anonymous by giving them warnings about how people have been de-anonymized, and also trying to help certain people be de-anonymized who I dislike. Um, I'm not really a privacy guy exactly. I'm one of these guys who, if every secret could be known about everybody, I think the world would be a better place. Because I've seen some weasley people try to conceal stuff that they shouldn't be able to get away with. However, I also realize that the more power you have, the more privacy you can afford. So since there's that, you know, Ah, inequity there, you pretty much have to fight for privacy where you can. Um, but personally, I first like knowing people's secrets. I'm creepy like that. Also, I am not a lawyer. If there is such a thing as a soul, I believe I have one. So some of the advice I'm going to give you is not legal advice in the legal advice sense of the word legal advice. <laughs> so, you know, take it with a huge grain of salt. I'm going to tell you best as I understand. And if you know more, let me know. Also, be careful where you surf you start playing around with Tor or ITP, which I'll explain slightly later. Uh, there's contraband out there. Most of the people who are on Tor and ITP and these dark nets, I think, are generally networking crypto weenies like I am. They just really dig this stuff. Um, but there's a few less savable people out there, let's say. Um, well, drug dealers, mixed feelings on that. Um, by the way, all my views are my own, unless you agree with me. Uh, but yeah, those drug dealers out there, there are pedophiles out there, uh, university administrators, or well, actually, they're, all, they're not smart enough to figure out how to get on tour, so that's, they're not out there. But there are some unseemly stuff out there, so be careful where you surf. Luckily, I highly recommend that you don't have any kind of caching turned on. Use a browser bundle. I have a whole three hour talk on how to do this stuff safely. This is going to be more on how people got de anonymized, but I am going to cover the basics of how tour works. A darknet in general is um, an anonymizing private network, is what I, my general um, definition of it. Usually you use encryption and proxies, multiple levels of proxies, to obscure who's talking to who and about what. Also, these things are sometimes referred to as cipher spaces. And I just love hearing that term. I just think that's the, that's what's clearer than darknet, because darknet means two things depending on who you ask. To people who set up honeypots, a darknet is unallocated IP space that you just put a bunch of stuff up in, and if anybody touches it, you know it's not legit. To me, a darknet is one of these anonymizing networks, so it's being double used. Then there's the deep web, or the dark web, and a bunch of other things. The deep web can, I guess, kind of include Tor and I2P, but it's also anything that's not indexed and on the surface, things like behind login portals and so forth. 
So the terms get kind of can get kind of confusing, but we'll talk a little bit about Tor. First of all, here's how Tor started off. It was originally a U.S. Navy research laboratory project. Then the EFF kind of took it over and started sponsoring it, and now it's its own 503C. 501. C3. See, I told you I'm not a lawyer, and certainly not one for um, uh, nonprofits. Anyway, here's why it was created. I'm just going to read what, that, right, what they said. Tor is free software and an open network that helps you defend against a form of network surveillance that threatens personal freedom and privacy, confidential business activities and relations, relationships, and state security known as traffic analysis. That's as defined by the site. And basically what it does, it allows you to access normal anonymous uh, sites on the internet anonymously, but it also allows you to visit hidden services. And it does this by letting you attach to a little local SOX proxy, which then forwards your traffic into the Tor network. Uh, the first thing you need to know about Tor is it has layered encryption, so each layer, each node you hop through has its own public-private key set that you're passing through. Um, it also has directory servers that kind of control everything. It's not exactly um, decentralized like something like I2P. And uh, it uh, has bi-directional tunnels, so the way you go out is the way you come back. And uh, mostly it's focused on proxying out to the public internet, though there is more and more hidden services. So that line is not as true as the first time I ever used this particular slide. Um, you can find out more about it on torproject.org. But let's talk about how it works. Basically, most of these dark nets work kind of like an ogre. They have layers. Tor stands for the onion router. And what happens is, let's say you send a message out there to request something. It's encrypted with at least three layers of encryption. The outer layer gets stripped off by the first node you pass through. That gets passed on to the next person after stripping off layer, and that gets passed on to the next person. So while this person here knows who sent them the message, and they can decrypt it and see what's in it, assuming it's not an extra level of encryption underneath it, like SSL again, uh, he doesn't know who it came from originally. This person doesn't know what the message is because it's still encrypted with this yellow encryption. But he does know it came from this one, but he doesn't know where it's ending up. And this guy also doesn't know what's in the content. He only knows it's going to forward onto here, but since it's encrypted with two other levels of encryption, he can't see it either. Uh, better yet, on top of that, you can also be using an SSL protected site, which is ideal, especially. Uh, with, uh, well, there have been people who have been attacked where someone set up a exit point, which what this is, that's a rogue exit point, and they'll sit there and they'll sniff the traffic and see what you're sending. There's some that even if you're using SSL, they'll use like SSL strip to try to drop that out and um, find out who you are. But that's how they, it works if you're just talking about talking to the public internet. If you're talking about Tor being used for hidden services, it's a little different. Let's say Bob wants to host um, some kind of a uh, website. It could be something else. It could be a box you SSH into. You can SSH over Tor too and do that to a hidden service. And actually that's one of the things that a uh, certain person will be mentioning here in a bit it, uh, probably should have. Um, but you, Bob sets up certain introductory points that people can contact him on and he talks to the DB and he makes sure the DB has this. So Bob picks some introductory points and builds circuits to them. By the way, this cloud you see it's actually like three levels of computers between Bob and the people he's talking to, so they don't know who he is directly. But that was hard to draw, so the tour people made these images. So this isn't a direct communication. There's actually like one, two, three machines or so between them, or at least two machines between them. I need to go look at some diagrams again. But anyway, after that, if Alice hears about some site exists, uh, I don't know, like the polyester road, if they find out that exists, they can request more info from the database, and she can set up a rendezvous point where she could um, have things, a connection made. But this rendezvous point, Alice writes a message to Bob using an encrypted uh, public key to a listing of listing the rendezvous point and a one-time secret, and asks the introduction point to deliver it to Bob. So she says, "Okay, introduction part, introductory point. Go ahead and talk to Bob. And tell him to meet me up here." at the rendezvous point. At that point, they can connect through the rendezvous point. Uh, they both have that one-time uh, secret now, and then they can start communicating back and forth. And between the two of them, there's essentially like six nodes in between them. You, you'd have to know all the traffic through to be able to figure out who's talking to who. That's by default. I believe that it can be configured. 
Um, different types of nodes you should probably be aware of. Those clients, that's just a user surfing around doing what they want. Those relays, these are people that actually forward traffic on. Those are the ones that sit in between. Uh, the bridges, which are also relays, but bridges are not announced. You can query the Tor directory service and find all the normal uh, relays. You can't find bridges. The reason for this is they don't they want to be able to give out bridges to people who are in countries that um, block Tor. And since not all the bridges are in one place to know about, what you do is you go out and you send an email and say, give me some bridges, or you go to a website and say, give me a few bridges, and there's no collection of all of them in one place that you can look up. So you can use those to um, kind of get around some censorship. Uh, also, those guard nodes, certain more trusted nodes are used for your first hop. Um, maybe that's correct. Uh, your first hop, because let's say um, there's a the type of attack that people can do uh, with traffic analysis that if they control the first node and the last node, they can tell something about you. For instance, if you see two megs of data go out or in your first your node here that you control, you don't control the one in the middle, but you control the one at the end. You see two megs come in, two megs go out at the same time, and then five megs come in, five megs go back at the same time. If the timing's right, you can kind of figure out who it is, even though it's encrypted. Signals intelligence stuff. Uh, that's why guard nodes exist. There's also introduction points for helping out with hidden services and rendezvous points for establishing those connections, like I said. Uh, if you want to see what it looks like, fire up the Tor browser bundle sometime. Just download it. I think there's every single platform out there. Pretty much there's a version for it. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a version for iOS. No, there is for Android. Uh, is there a phone for iOS? Anybody play with an iOS? I haven't had much use for iOS other than uh, web surfing from while I'm sleeping. Anyway. Tails is another uh, is a distribution of Linux you might want to look into. The nice thing about it, it's a bootable CD or you can create a thumb drive and it does extra things to keep you anonymous. Uh, for instance, the certain ways you can break out of Tor and make someone contact you outside the network, they have firewall rules to help keep that from happening. Not to mention, once you um, pull the disk out, you're leaving only uh, remnants that should be around of what's in memory. And if you shut down the machine, and you know, hold it away from someone for this long so that the memory erases itself, you're good. The reason I say that, have you ever heard the cold boot attack? There's a certain limited amount of time that if you get to a machine fast enough, you can actually pull out the RAM, put it someplace else, and capture the data on it. It's an incredibly short amount of time, even if you, you know, super cool the uh, memory, but eh, it's possible. There's also proxies like Tor to Web if you want to visit some of these Tor sites. Uh, over the public internet, but keep in mind you're not going to be anonymous if you do that. The, there's the Tor Hidden Wiki, which has a list of a bunch of them. Skyline's a neat little tool, which we won't talk about much other than say, if you ever see like a, a Tor hidden service that has a special name like Silk Road, there's a way you can brute force the generation of your keys that, that help assign your dot .onion name, and that helps you do that. I think it uses um, the GPU to help quickly do that. That way you can have a semi-significant name. As you can see, that's not a name you all are going to remember. But you can like brute force the first six characters of it or so, so at least it has some kind of meaning to it. Uh, Onion Cat and uh, oh yeah, that's just some of the forwarding things over uh, Tor, which I'm not going to really cover here. And if you want to know more about uh, Tor in general, check out Reddit Onions. Uh, Tor has some pros and cons. If you can tunnel it through Sox Proxy, you can generally get it to go through Tor. Um, however, you're generally just going to be doing TCP. Uh, there's three levels of proxying also. Each node does not know who the next, well, does not know the one, let me phrase this, maybe this is exactly as I say it. Three levels of proxying, each node not knowing the one before or last, making things very anonymous. So you know who sent you the data, but you don't know who sent it in originally, and it's still encrypted on that man and the person in the middle, so you can't necessarily, he can't tell, he can tell who it's going to on the next hop, but he can't decrypt and see what it is. So because of those three levels, it makes it hard to know who's saying what to who. Another kind of a uh, toy is it's kind of slow, it's, though it seems to have been improving over um, recent years because you're going through multiple levels. Uh, there's no way it's ever going to be as fast as your general internet connection because, well, it's going over your general internet connection and it's going through several hops. So there's going to be some latency. Um, also, another problem is how much do you trust your exit nodes? There was a case a while back of, of some people, they wanted to get out of the host country and the embassy they were at, so they were like um, visiting their email and so forth over Tor. Unfortunately, I think they were using like POP3 email, which by default passed its password in clear text. So while the host country couldn't directly spy on them, whoever was running the Tor exit nodes could. 
Um, I have a friend named Bob who's kind of curious what all was, uh, and by the way, anybody can set up one of these tour X nodes. You can set one up at your house. I had a friend named Bob, yeah, I don't know Bob personally, I just know him on the internet, yeah, um, who set up a tour node because he wanted to know what kind of traffic was going across the network. And he sat there and sniffed it and sniffed it for a while and, and collected data to figure out what it was. As far as images are concerned, there is a lot of Asian pornography going across there. Um, I, it, but that stuff that would be perfectly legal in the United States. That's a large percentage of the, of the data, Bob tells me. Um, however, my understanding, there's certain very strict pornography laws in some Asian countries. So the thought is that there was a whole lot of people visiting porn sites in a country where it's illegal over tour. But there's also some stuff that would be very much contraband here in the United States. We'll talk a little bit about that here in a second. Oh, by the way, remember I mentioned it has a semi-fixed infrastructure with that directory? That directory servers have been blocked before by various countries, well, China, for instance. And I think it's doing some of the uprisings in uh, the Middle East that's also happened. Also, it's really easy to tell if someone's uh, running Tor from the server side. Uh, for instance, if you visit my website using Tor, it shows you a little, like, Tor logo up in the top left-hand corner. If you visit it from I2P, it shows you an I2P logo. Because it's fairly easy to spot that. Now, if you know what the traffic looks like, on your local box, you're generally talking to port uh, 9050 or 9051. Um, Unless you're using the Tor browser bundle, which you probably should be, uh, that uses 9150 and uh, 9151. As far as remote traffic, it's generally all going to look like it's SSL encrypted traffic uh, going over port 443 and some over 80, I believe, uh, unless they've changed that recently. Uh, but while it looks like SSL traffic, it's still identifiable because of certain patterns and how it's used. There's actually something they've been working on on um, oh, sort of anonymizing relays that change the protocol look, look so that it can't be spotted by traffic analysis like that. But I have some details on, uh, if you ever want to spot Tor nodes visiting your site, I have some details on my webpage. And I'm going to try to get this version of the slides uploaded and shared via my Twitter feed uh, by the, sometime at the end of the talk. Quick shout out to ITP. Originally when I did intros to Darknets, I'd always talk about ITP because it's a smaller project. Well, small in the sense it's not as used as much. It's Java-based, and its focus is more on the hidden services I'll be talking about in a bit. But the reason I'm ta talking about it here is because none of the people who have been busted have really used I2P, at least not the, you know, what they talk about getting busted. It's not because I2P is inherently more secure. I'm not saying that. It's just somewhat less used. The same things that these people got denonymized by could have got an I2P user, because none of it's really breaking Tor. It's breaking well, end-user clients. Um, people doing silly things in it, people having bad OPSEC. But um, I2P is another project I want to give a shout out to. Go check it out. I think I have some stickers of this that um, the developers gave me at DEF CON. Also, a little bit about Bitcoin. Who all has, who all has heard of Bitcoin? Who all has actually used it? A few people. So generally, a quick description of Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is referred to as a cryptocurrency. Essentially, it uses proof-of-work algorithms. Now, these are kind of interesting concepts. Remember in the late 90s when you got constant spam over everything? One of the proposed solutions for that was a proof-of-work uh, you know, extension to email systems, to where if somebody wanted to um, actually send you an email, they'd first have to answer a challenge, essentially. They'd have to generate a hash of a certain size and do a certain amount of mathematical work before they could actually send you an email. Well, that never took off as far as stopping spam, um, but it has a... Uh, well, the thing about the hash is it's easy for you to check whether or not someone ha hashed something correctly. It's hard for them to um, make the fake hash. For instance, you might say, how many of this particular number in series will hash to this particular value. And you might be able to tell that quickly, but they will take a while to generate it, if you get my uh, drift. Or say, what, what is this? I'm trying to think of a good algorithm, and I'm totally screwing this up. Um, proof of work algorithm, let's say I uh, have randomly chosen a certain number of zeros to attack onto another random number. And I say, here's this random number. How many zeros did I put on it? Or, or here's my hash. How many zeros does it contain in it? It's going to take you a certain time to generate that hash collision while I had the original value, so it's pretty much instantaneous for me. And I can use that as a way of checking that you've done the work. 
Now this does slow down even normal email just a little bit, but it has the advantage of, well, for one person, if it takes you an extra second to send an email, yeah, it's not a big deal. If it takes an extra, you know, second for someone to send out each email in a set of a million emails, that's pretty significant to a spammer. But uh, this never really took off for stopping spam. However, it did take off as far as um, cryptocurrency. And Bitcoin uses proof of work algorithms to uh, generate Bitcoins. And uh, the way Bitcoins work is you have a Bitcoin address and private keys associated with that address that you keep private, of course, because they're called private keys. And people can send this money back and forth to each other via these Bitcoin addresses. Everything is kept track of in, the, in a distributed peer-to-peer -peer blockchain, which is kind of like a ledger, keeping track of who owes who what money, or actually who's paid who what money would be a more accurate way of saying it. There's also tumblers. If, if you didn't use a tumbler, it's possible, still a pain, possible for you to say, all right, this address sent $50,000 worth of Bitcoins to this address, then this same address sent $50,000 to another person, and you'd know who was doing what to who, if you had enough nodes in the network, I suppose, and if you knew the IP addresses associated with the very first communication revolving that particular Bitcoin address. Still be difficult. What tumblers do is they mix that up. They like say, okay, you sent me 50, I'll send uh, 25 to here, I'll send 10 to here, I'll send two to here, collect it all back here and send it back out. So it really confuses things. Uh, if you want to know more information on Bitcoin, crypto is really not my thing. Um, Bob Weiss does a great talk on it. I recorded him at uh, B-Sides uh, Delaware this last year, so I'd recommend checking it out. Okay, now we're going to actually get to the cases, 21 minutes in. Uh, but I wanted you all to have basics of Tor. How many actually have actually used Tor before? Okay, so it's probably worth covering it a little bit. But uh, just the main thing you need to know, multiple levels of proxies, multiple levels of encryption. So people don't know who's talking to who about what. But the first case I want to talk about, this is back in December 16th of 2013. There was a bomb threat made at Harvard and it was sent to the Harvard uh, student newspaper and a few officials there. And essentially what the threat read was shrapnel bombs placed in Science Center, Silver Hall, Emerson Hall, Fair Hall, uh, two slash four, guess correctly, be quick or they will go off soon. So he's saying that, you know, at least in two of those buildings, he set up the bomb. Well, the way he sent this message to uh, the student newspaper as well as the officials, my understanding, is via guerrilla mail. And um, he connected the guerrilla mail over Tor. So that's a step in the right direction as far as anonymity is concerned. However, there's a problem with doing that. Guerrilla mail puts an X originating IP header in. I've, you know, I, I created my own one and sent an email to myself via guerrilla mail. And this is what the headers look like. No, that's not my real home IP address. But if you've been sniffing the network here, you probably know what it is now anyway. So by looking at that, they can see, oh, this is the IP address of the person who talked to guerrilla mail. From that, they could tell it was Tor, because all the Tor nodes are publicly known except for those bridges I mentioned. By the way, if this guy had used bridges, wouldn't have got caught in the same way at least. And if you want to see what bridges are active in what countries, you can actually go to this website and find those. Um, it's really easy to correlate uh, who was attached to the Harvard network at a certain time, assuming they were not using a bridge node in Tor, because you can just say, oh, this IP address seems to belong to Tor. Actually, I want to show you something else real quick. Uh, I, I log the people who visit me over Tor. Even if you didn't query their directory, a lot of the names in here will tell you that they are Tor. For instance, torservers.net, that's likely a Tor box. Tor exit server, torland.is, yeah, that's probably a Tor, uh, Tor node. So they knew the guy used Tor because of the email address in there. Now granted, oh sorry, the, the IP address in the previous slide. However, that IP address was not who he was directly contacting to or from. Because remember, there was those three levels of uh, proxying. However, they knew he was using Tor. So let's search the network for anybody who was contacting Tor during that particular time period. And they found this guy, Eldo Kim. I'm sorry if I mispronounced anybody's names in this, because a lot of these people I've only read about in uh, articles and uh, court documents and not necessarily heard how their name is said. But uh, he was someone who was connected to the Tor network around that time. I'm not sure he was the only one or not, but he was the one they started interviewing. And uh, apparently during the interview, he told him he wanted to get out of a file and he admitted to setting up or doing the bomb threat. There was no actual bombs, but he was the one who admitted to actually doing it. 
There's a lot more details in these articles, which, like I said, I'll get the slides out there. So let's talk about some lessons learned from this particular case sample. Um, don't be the only person using Tor on a monitored network. <laughs> that would be a good thing. And you know what? But the thing is, we don't know if he's the only person. This is a university. I would hope Harvard had more than one person using Tor at the time. I mean, I don't know what kind of computer security research school they have. I mean, they, I assume they have IT programs. I know of Harvard, I think, mostly for medicine and law, is it? Um, but um, I'm, I'm sure they have to have some IT people, too, or some not, you know. The school I went to, we actually had uh, people like dedicated to anonymity. Uh, so I'm assuming they'd have more than one person on Tor. However, and we'll get onto that in a second. If he used the bridge, that probably also would have helped because they wouldn't necessarily have known he was connected to Tor at the time. Unless they did some deep, deeper packet inspection, there is a ways to tell that it was Tor because of how the um, packets are designed, the, you know, the size of certain, um, sizes of certain packets, even though it is all encrypted, unless you use certain um, obfuscating proxies that change what the protocol looks like, and a lot of that seems to be still very much in beta. But they're working on it. The basic idea is you'd be able to make your Tor traffic look like Skype or something else. Another thing, don't admit anything. He may not have been the only person using Tor, but he admitted to everything, and that's you know, ultimately how he got caught. If he hadn't, if they couldn't find any remnants on his hard drive, if he had been using um, some, something like Tails, uh, they may not have had any proof that he was the one that did it. And correlation attacks are a bitch. And we'll talk about correlation attacks in a bit. And his is a old, super simple version of correlation attacks. There's much more advanced attacks that you cover in uh, academic classes on uh, privatizing, privatizing networks. But let's say a client sent five megabytes into the network. And I have two little evil Tor nodes here. And how can you tell they're evil? They're evil twins. Well, sometimes not like exactly evil twins, but um, because of the little goatee, that's how you know they're evil. Don't tell Ralph I said that. Actually, now that I look at these things, these things look a lot like Ralph. I'm going to get a picture of him next time for this. But anyway, you send five megs out, you see eight megs come back in. Even though that was encrypted, like with three levels of encryption, back and forth, well, you saw five megs of encrypted go through here and through here, and you sent back eight, and you also saw eight here. So if you control both the first point and the last point, you could see who that is or have a good idea who's sending that traffic. And that's similar to the way they caught him, except for his was way simple. They just said, oh, you were using Tor? You admit it? Okay, cool. Or you admit it and you admit sending this email. There's also timing correlation attacks where you figure out um, when the data got there. Uh, there's different ways you can also manipulate timing uh, correlation attacks. You can just watch the timings of when the packets go, like, you know, five megs in here, back out there in a short amount of time, and the same kind of message back. Um, you can also DOS the outside of the network to affect traffic. Like let's say I know this is a Tor exit point, or sorry, a Tor node. I can try to make the traffic have a pattern to it by the, um, disrupting that particular node in the middle. Uh, it's also possible if you're one of the nodes that flows through, you could pulse the data yourself. Or you can change the path on a load using legitimate Tor traffic. I believe those are, all right, who here is a mobile comic book fan? Four comics? Maginal, Ma not, not Maginal, that's the, um, actually I've ever started a firewall company, I call it the Maginal Line Firewall Company. But uh, Mulgineer, I think it is, Four's Hammer. There was a project that I believe it was the NSA, and from what I read in the documents, it seemed it was something like doing this. Um, there's also DNS leaks. This is when you don't configure uh, your Tor client properly. Those dot .onion addresses, but if you try to query for one of those dot .onion addresses to your ISP's DNS servers, well, they may not know what traffic you were going to send to the Silk Road, but they know you tried to visit it. And that could be too much information for them to have. And if I recall right, by default, Firefox, if you attach to a SOX proxy, it queries over the local DNS server you have configured on your host. By default, you can change that with a quick config setting in about config, but if you use the Tor browser bundle, it's already set by default to send everything through the SOX proxy, so you don't have yourself de 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 via uh, DNS. And basically the way that works, you want to know where this one particular someplace.onion is, or even a someplace.com, like iongeek.com, while all the traffic to it is going to be sent over Tor, if you don't have DNS configured properly, if you don't tell it to resolve over the SOX, it's going to send that DNS query right to the uh, possibly monitored DNS server. Now let's talk about case one. I'm starting from zero like any good programmer should. 
All right, who heard of Lowell Sec? These are guys who were having a lot of fun a couple years ago. Well, one of the guys, uh, Hector here, also known as Cebu, he normally used Tor for connecting to IRC. Uh, not all IRC networks will let you, but some will, and he was using this to help anonymize who he was. But one time, he decided, oh, I'm not going to connect via Tor, or something may have dropped, some connection problem, I don't know exactly why, but he ended up using IRC directly. Well, that allowed the FBI to find his home IP address, and after being caught, he started to collaborate to try to, I guess, get an easier sentence. By the way, there was another guy, I think his name was Ryan Clear, I think it was a British teen, who um, controlled some IRC servers, and he got uh, in a, uh, some kind of pissing match with other members of Anonymous. So he said, well, you know, you're all using IRC servers, I can dump your real IP addresses. There's a, I'm trying to think of the term for it now, there's an anonymization you can use on, um, on IRC to basically say, cloak my IP address and just say this whenever someone does a right-click info or an, an info on me. Um, but that doesn't help if the person who is running the IRC server is running the IRC server, because he sees the actual IPs that are connect, unless, of course, you're using something like Tor. What surprises me about this is there are all completely Tor-based IRC servers they could have used. Yes, they're more of a pain to set up, but they could have kept it all private from each other. They wouldn't know who's running the IRC server, and they wouldn't know who was connecting to them. But they didn't do that. And actually, um, IGP makes that real easy. Uh, they have that built in um, and easy to use. Well, there was a, a guy that Hector spoke to named Jeremy Hammond, though they didn't know it was Jeremy Hammond at the time. He went by the handle SUPG and I think a few other ones on IRC. And uh, Jeremy casually let slip various things, like I think it was like, oh, I think some friends that he was involved with that got arrested in a certain place or places where he was arrested. And they, some of the things he said kind of led them to think, oh, he's in the Midwest. And so you look for people in the Midwest that attend a certain type of rally, who get arrested at certain kind of rallies, or get detained at certain kind of rallies, and it greatly you know, cuts down on the people you have to look at, especially when you have a prior record, because, um, well, Jeremy had a prior record for hacking various websites that he didn't politically agree with. So that narrowed it down, and so because of the things he said, narrowed it down, it was enough to get, oh, well, a pin trap put on him, which in this case was basically uh, see who all is using his wireless access point uh, and at what times. So Hammond did use Tor consistently to my knowledge. I don't believe he ever got caught because he didn't use Tor when he should have. However, while the crypto was never busted, the FBI was able to correlate times when SUPG was talking to Sabu on IRC when Hammond was at home using his computer. And he was the only person at home using his computer. They was able to track the MAC address because uh, even if you're using encryption to your home wireless access point, you're still going to be able to decipher the MAC address. And there's one that one person talking, and the times that he went online and went offline perfectly correlated, or very closely correlated, with when Cebu was talking to Sub-G. And there's a lot more details on Oz technical articles. Actually, the Oz technical articles are some of the best write-ups I've seen on a lot of these things. So I highly recommend you go read them if you're curious about these. Also, diving into court documents gives you some extra details, although they're a little bit drier. So, lessons learned from LulzSec. First of all, Use Tor consistently. If you use it, well, let's say half-assed, you use it one time, and then a different time you don't use it, that's going to cause you issues. Um, Tor Browser Burner doesn't have this problem so much, but people who configure Tor manually because they want to use Internet Explorer or whatever, um, they might have some problems. Like, let's say my website delivers a cookie to you, and you visit me over Tor, then you visit me, and let's say you want to try to do a SQL injection attack on my website. I used to troll people who did various types of attack on me by popping for a clippy and saying, looks like you're trying to include, do a remote file include. Would you like help with that? And links them off to the OWASP site. Uh, uh, I'm a bit of a wise ass. Um, but, uh, so let's say they did that attack then, and I dropped a cookie on them. Well, if they visited again later on without using Tor, because they were going to do completely legitimate traffic, you know, just visit my page and look around, I could tie to that cookie I sent them over Tor with the cookie they visited me with when they weren't using Tor, and figure out who they are. So that's another reason to use Tor consistently. Also, don't give personal information. Don't say, well, I was arrested here, or you know, I live in this location, or give away a lot of hints about yourself. Uh, correlation attacks are still a bitch, because they were able to figure out enough to say, OK, we think it's this Jeremy Hammond guy. Now let's actually put a pin trap on his network and see when he's connecting and when Cebu is talking to him, and they were able to quickly figure out who he was. 
Another case example to give you is Freedom Hosting. Um, Freedom Hosting was well, essentially a hosting company that hosted everything inside of Tor. So among other things, they had, uh, let's say, child porn related hidden service websites. Well, Anonymous got a little pissed off about this. Um, all right, who all here? Uh, mm, who all here thinks Anonymous actually has a leadership? I have a whole different talk on Anonymous, which because I used in term, yeah, sorry, in culture terms, I think the quote that my buddy gave me from the organizers and why I wasn't invited back was, well, Mr. Christian Charles' talk was well researched. It was wholly inappropriate. But um, the anonymous people, there's only one thing I can say that's a consistent thing about them, and that is they do it for the lulls. And a lot of them enjoy, you know, poking people and, you know, being crude. So, um, but occasionally you have people who have a particular uh, interest and go um, fight for it. The way Anonymous works, it doesn't really have any central core goals. What happens is there's various IRC chat rooms, various forums and so forth. Someone says, hey, wouldn't it be funny if we wouldn't screw to these people? And if enough people agree, they go do it. And in the case of Scientology, a lot of people agreed and went and did it. That was like one of the biggest things. With smaller things, like um, some of the other non-op stuff, it was smaller. Uh, most people will agree that child porn is bad. And so they decided to go after the Freedom Hosting. And I think they dumped some um, databases of some people who were hosted inside of uh, Freedom Hosting. So, you know, they'd already, you know, stirred up the pot a little bit before. But the FBI compromised um, some Freedom Hosting servers at one point in time in July of 2013. And they inserted some malicious JavaScript that exploited the bug in Firefox CVE 213-1690. There will be a test later. You must remember that. In version 17, extended service release, as I recall that's what it stands for. Uh, the Tor browser bundle is based on Firefox. That's its core engine. I think there's also a portable version for, uh, that uses Chrome that someone else produces. But it, the browser bundle is well developed, and it had already been patched. They already knew about it. However, how many people down, how many people timely upgrade stuff like that? Even people who are big into anonymity don't always remember to update. And I do a lot of talks on anonymity for a person who can't hardly say anonymity. I'm going to get me a button in an Arduino that just says the word for me whenever I press it. Anyway, so it had been patched, but a lot of people hadn't patched themselves. So this allowed the FBI to look in on them and go, oh, you're visiting this site, you're visiting this site, you're visiting this site. So you can do arbitrary code execution with this particular vulnerability. So they used the payload apparently called Magneto, which eh, sends back some information. And it foams home to an IP. Do some analysis of this particular piece of malware from the FBI at that link. Um, like I said, don't worry about photoing or any of that. I'll have all these links up later on if you're really that curious. Um, it also reports back various things about the computer, like its MAC address, the Windows host name, and a unique serial number to tie the user to the site visit. Some, one of what I said seems to, read, seemed to indicate it was the same thing as egotistical giraffe, but I believe that was an NSA project that used the same exploit, but it was a different payload. So it was kind of similar. I'm somehow dying the FBI and the NSA to share that much information in that form. I'm not sure, but um, anyway. Egotistical giraffe is a similar project. Also, you know, there's all sorts of malware that's been developed by law enforcement, like Magic Lantern, Fox Asset is another one. Well, actually, I think that's more intelligence community than anything else. Some of these things, like Fox Asset and uh, Egotistical Giraffe, was uh, leaked by Snowden back in the day. Everybody say evil computer. All right, thank you. Um, he looks like my evil computer picture. All right, also there's um, Zipav, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, which is something that's been used in the past. By the way, thanks to Joe Cicero, I was at ThoughtCon how many weeks ago? Uh, re recently, and he was giving a talk on evading uh, surveillance, and it's really, it was a really good talk. I'm hoping he does it someplace else because they don't record their talks. Yes, I offered. They don't do that one. I did record beside Chicago, though. But if, if he does his talk someplace else, check it out. He turned me on to CPAB. All right, here's another case. Case number two if you count like a programmer. There was this Irishman, Eric Inolo Margulies. I have no idea how to pronounce that middle name. Anybody, we got any Irish people here? They're down at the bar already, I'm sorry. All right, um, yeah, Eric was apparently the person they thought was hosting Freedom Hosting. And I'm not quite sure how they tied him to it. 
It may be because of payment records. For instance, they find out, oh, this one particular server, after we bust it, after we break into it, is actually at this one IP address. Well, we find out who's actually leasing that IP address, or who owns that particular um, private server, who's renting it, and you can tie it to somebody if the record shows such. Well, so, um, Mark, uh, Marquez was said to die for his laptop when the police came to raid him because he wanted to shut it off. Because if the laptop is encrypted, that's all fine and good, but if it's still up and running and not locked, they can still get the data out of it. And there's a lot more details on a Wired article, but there's also the lessons we can learn from this one also. First of all, don't host Captain Picard or Julian Bashir. Remember I went back to the whole anonymous thing? A lot of stuff from anonymous sprung up on 4chan. Those are terms for um, initials. Captain Picard is CP, which is child porn. Uh, Julian Bashir is JB, jailbait. Don't host that and he wouldn't have nearly as much problems because if all he was hosting was stuff that, uh, stuff like political dissidents websites, as long as it was his terrorist stuff, uh, the FBI wouldn't have cared, uh, the NSA wouldn't have cared, no one would have cared probably. If he just hosted crypto weenie stuff like a lot of us do, no one would have cared. Actually, there was probably a lot of that stuff out there too. Oh, a, a note I should say about this, which I didn't have in the slides. Uh, Freedom Hosting also hosted some mail servers, and the FBI now has access to all those mail servers, which makes me wonder how many more busts... Well, I'm expecting we should have seen a lot more busts, because how many people here, first thing they do when they get a new email address is test it by sending an email to one of the other email addresses. I wonder if the FBI has actually gone through the database of email they got from Freedom Hosting, and look through it, because they, ho they hosted the big, I think it was Tor Mail they, they, they um, hosted. I wonder if anybody's actually um, gone through that and said, oh, who's emailed who is the first email to tie who's who? And nothing else is probably a trivial trove of information that anybody actually wants to read through that. Of course, patch, patch, patch. If everybody had patched, you know, as soon as it came out, that would have been solved. I'm not sure that Tor browser bundle at the time alerted you that there was a new version out. I think it does now because there's like a little warning icon saying, oh, there's a newer version of uh, Tor Browser Bundle out there. But if you don't patch, if these guys had all patched, you know, as soon as the problem was known about, it would have been no problem for them. Also, follow the money. My understanding is they probably found him because they found the server. They compromised it. Because, um, and I'm going to show you, if you just have the darknet address for a site, how to possibly de-anonymize it. Uh, but once they de-anonymize that, they can find out who owns that IP address, hopefully, and, uh, well, come and get them. Also, leave encrypted laptops in a powered down state when not in use. I don't know if he was actually using it at the time or what. He wasn't exactly standing in front of it, apparently, since he had to die for it, according to reports. But, um, yeah, because if it's powered on, the encryption's not really worth so much. So, making a hidden server contact you over the public internet, and we have time at the end. Actually, we have time because I'm the last talk of the day, so y'all can leave whenever you want, but I'm going to keep talking until I'm finished. You two have to stay. That's my, uh, what, evil monkey look. Anybody here love Futurama? That's not Futurama, that's Family Guy. Futurama has a different one. Futurama has the one with the silly hat that gets really intelligent when he puts it on. Anyway, they look similar to me, though. All right, so you can make a hidden server contact you over the public internet. Let's say you have a exploit, let's say it's a web-based exploit. If you've got an interpreter shell in someone's box and you send it to them over Tor, well, you can still get them to contact you back on your real IP address. And when they do that, you can figure out who they are. I'm going to show a web vulnerability-based version of that on the weakest application ever written. And I'll, I'll show that in a second. It's the weakest application ever written because I started it. My buddy Jeremy continued it, but we'll talk about it in a bit. This is my final case uh, before I do some demos. The Silk Road. Who all here has heard of the Silk Road? Who here all here is a regular purchaser? Eh. Well, Silk Road itself is gone, although uh, pretty quickly afterwards, Silk Road 2 did pop up, so that is out there. And there was all sorts of you know, stuff they sold. I adjust the resolution back down. Uh, here's just a few of the items they have. Um, yeah, I would not want to click in the erotica. I'm not sure what they're going to have in there. Um, alcohol, I'm not sure why that's here. I actually did go to this link, and it wasn't alcohol when I visited it. But anyway, a new version of uh, Silk Road has popped up, and now you know what my identities on there, which I won't be using again, but there you go. <laughs> um, but 
the Silk Road basically allowed people to buy and sell things that were a little bit less than legal in general, and also do services. So he, from some of the um, court documents, we found out all these different things that you could buy on there. So we got pretty much every drug that you'd ever want in a Cheech and Chong movie up there. So we're good. Um, that's, uh, that's definitely, oh, what was his, um, uh, not, Emilio Estevez's brother. It's so weird I can remember Emilio Estevez, but not Charlie Sheen. Maybe it's because I like Paulo Abdul so much. But anyway, Charles, Charlie, Charlie Sheen would probably refer to that as winning up there. There was also a bunch of services you could get, like, you know, contracts out on people's lives. Uh, at one time, counterfeit bills, though I think they had a policy against that at some other point in time. Um, just tons of different services you can get that's all in that report. Oh, stolen credit card information, all sorts of fun stuff. But they did change to where you couldn't do certain things. Like apparently, sales could not list forgeries of any private issued documents such as diploma certifications, tickets, or receipts. Also, listing for counterfeit uh, currency are still not allowed in the money section. Though counterfeit bills are listed up above. So I'm not sure I mean, they changed the policies maybe at some point in time. I'm really not sure why you, they were OK with um, documents like, uh, well, driver's license and fake IDs, but they were not okay with diplomas and certifications. And I don't know exactly why they drew the line there. But, well, they, they got about you know, $1.2 billion in business. That's a whole lot for little sites you can't even get to on the public internet. So the FBI obviously took a little bit of an interest in them. They started to look for the earliest references to the Silk Road on the public internet, and of course they found some. So they started doing some searches uh, via time and finding out, all right, what's the earliest mention we could find? And for the reports I read, they found a post on Shroomery that essentially was this guy asking about, hey, have you all heard about um, Silk Road? So, you know, I came across this website called Silk Road. It's a tour hidden service that claims to allow you to buy and sell anything online anonymously. I'm thinking of buying from it, but wanted to see if anyone here has heard of it or could recommend it. I found it through Silk Road uh, Wood, uh, WordPress address there, which is uh, 420s in the address. That's awesome. If you have a Tor browser, directs you to the real site, and it's got the uh, .onion address. I know it's too small for anybody to read but me here. Uh, uh, let me know what you think. The fact that he asked, let me know what you think, the FBI investigators went, he's asking what you think, so it sounds like he might own the site. But he's also like the first post they can find about it. So that's a quick sign that Hmm, this Altoid guy who posted this may be interesting. By the way, using the same username in multiple places, really bad for your anonymity. But let's cover up the next uh, little uh, breadcrumb. By the way, uh, in the case of him, I think a death by a thousand paper cuts. All right, all right uh, a thousand bleeding flesh wounds in his case. There was some really bad OPSEC here. But there was other things that he had gone out and posted. He posted a very similar message on bitcointalk.org. And he posted that one uh, back in January 29th. Essentially, it said, uh, what an awesome thread, because people were talking about, I think it was a heron shop online. Actually, let me go back to that. Yeah, a real heron store. Uh, what an awesome thread. You guys have a ton of great ideas. Has anyone seen Silk Road yet? It's kind of like an anonymous Amazon.com. I don't think they have heron on there, but they are selling other stuff. They basically use Bitcoin and Tor to broker anonymous transactions. It's at address, which I am so not going to read. Those not uh, familiar with Tor can go to Silk Road. 420wordpress.com for instructions on how to access the Onion site. Let me know what you think. Again, so quick idea of who that is. Now this is the part where he really screwed up though, because he used Altoid again, and uh, let's see, so it's called the previous one was also Altoid, but this time, well, you can see what he did. He was starting to ask questions about how someone could, well, how, um, an IT, he was looking for an IT pro in the Bitcoin community to help him out with something. And he signed it, well, or he told people to email him at this particular name, Ross Ulbrich at gmail.com. So now this name is tied very much to Altoid, and it's out there for the world to see, back on 10.11.11. Not so good. Asking questions about um, how to set up a Bitcoin thing and putting your name on it and being the same guy named Altoid who'd posted about the Silk Road before anyone else did on the internet. Yeah, bad OPSEC. So, Ulbrich's uh, Google Plus profile also shows that he had similar interests to the Dread Pirate Roberts, who's the guy who was the lead leader of the Silk Road, the guy who uh, was the core person running it. And um, 
his website, or his uh, Google Plus site of Obrix, uh, shows that he was interested in the uh, Mises Institute, which is apparently uh, involved with the Australian School of Economics. And Dread Pirate Roberts' signature on the Silk Road, uh, it had, uh, its form signature basically had a link off to that particular group. So that shows he had a similar interest to Dread Pirate Roberts. So that's another little bit of information that says maybe it's him. I think the email address was the biggest giveaway, though. Um, Ross Obrecht's account uh, also posted on Stack Overflow, and he was asking for help with some PHP code to connect to a Tor hidden server. And at first, he used the name Frosty. Well, actually, at first, the name uh, he, his first his username was Ross Ulbrich, but then he quickly changed it to Frosty because I think he went, "Oh, that's not good. I shouldn't use Ross Ulbrich for this question that may lead someone to evidence that I've run the Silk Road or started it up." So yeah, that wasn't so great. So guess who's now a suspect after all that for being uh, the Dread Pirate Roberts? Robert William Ulbrich. Uh, and yes, that's about the facial expression I think I would have if all of a sudden the FBI was after me. All right, so someone was. Um, Connecting to the servers, they found some evidence. You know, they somehow or another got access to one of the servers that runs the Silk Road. I'm not quite sure how they do this. The court documents I read don't really seem to reveal it. They may have found an uh, exploit to get control of it. They may have had um, someone else they busted. So, I mean, some things seem to, I think I've seen some in the window that basically said that maybe one of his um, admins got busted while a drug deal was coming to him. For instance, like, let's say the postal inspector breaks open a mail and it's like, you know, two pounds of cocaine. And they say, oh, who's it going to? They start talking to that guy like, oh, yeah, I help run the Silk Road. Please let me free if I show you stuff. If they have an admin that helps admin the Silk Road. That gives them access to the servers. Once they have access to the servers, they can do more things. Or they could have used the exploit on it and uh, figured out its real IP address and then got control over it. But once they got control over some parts of the Silk Road, they were able to look at like, private messages. And they were able to figure out that, um, well, they knew Ross lived in San Francisco. And uh, via various messages, they narrowed it down to um, uh, Dread Pirate Roberts because of things he said that he lived in the Pacific time zone. Also, there was an IP of a Silk Road server that was attached to over a particular VPN server that was connected to by an IP belonging to an internet cafe on uh, Laguna Street in San Francisco, from which Ulbrick had also connected to his Gmail account both on the same day. Also, there was a PM uh, to Dread Pirate Roberts from a user that said the site was um, leaking some sort of external IP address belonging to the VPN. The court documents I read didn't really go into enough detail on this. So I'm wondering if there was some exploit or some kind of bad code that said, like, this is what my real local IP address is. He quickly fixed that, and he started um, killing records on that VPN server that still said who the last person who connected to it was. But my saying he tried to wipe some data, but not totally successfully. You have to read the court documents yourself to. Um, some of them aren't necessarily as uh, technical detail as I'd like. Uh, all right, so the FBI starts taking down uh, Silk Road servers. I'm not quite sure exactly how they do it, and they start. They could have been money trails. I'm not sure. Uh, it could have been aliases that were used because um, they had some of his aliases. Because uh, he well, he did something really silly here in a bit. I'm gonna tell you about because he ordered some fake IDs, and those fake IDs may or may not have had the names on them of people who had leased those particular servers. It's not clear from the documentation I have, so we're not 100% sure yet. But anyway, on 7-10-2013, U.S. Customs intercepted nine IDs with different names, but all having a picture of Ulbrich. Uh, Homeland Security interviewed Ulbrich, but he denied having ordered them. First of all, I can understand getting fake IDs, but why would you get the fake IDs of someone who's not choose, you know, get their face on it? Why would you get someone else's face on fake IDs? I wouldn't even want to frame up for some, I suppose. But uh, that seems a little fishy that he said it wasn't him. And he did do something smart. Ulbrich, apparently, according to uh, the FBI report, uh, generally refused to answer any questions pertaining to the purchase of this or other counterfeit identity documents. That's generally a good idea. There's a lot of document out, documentaries out there that say, don't talk to the cops if you don't want to get busted. So that was a bright thing. He, uh, he, he understood that. Then there was the pitifully stupid. However, Ulbrich volunteered that hypothetically anyone could go onto a website named The Silk Road on Tor and purchase any drugs or fake identity documents the person wanted. Why the hell did he volunteer that bit of information? I have no idea why he thought that was a good idea. Anyway, also his roommates knew him as Josh, but the IDs he had on him at the time gave his real name. And um, 
PM showed that Dread Pirate Roberts had been interested in getting some fake IDs. So, yeah, this is a lot of information. Also, one of the boxes they uh, were able to get SSH keys on listed Frosty at Frosty as, well, I guess Frosty was the, the host he was connecting from, Frosty as the username. Um, and remember how he changed the name from Ross Ulbricht to Frosty on that one particular Stack Overflow uh, account? Yeah. Also, the stuff they were on, some of the same code that was posted on Stack Overflow was there. So they had a good idea of him, and they landed on him in a library on 10-01-2013. Uh, and uh, basically, as soon as he entered the password, they uh, landed on him in the library. And more evidence was found on his laptop. Not sure if it was encrypted or not, but since they landed on him so fast, I'm assuming they assumed it was at the very least. Uh, big thanks, by the way, to Nate Anderson, who wrote the uh, Ars Technica article I got most of those details from, and also Agent Christopher Tarbell, who wrote the, uh, the best write-up I've seen as far as the, the court documents that I, I took a look at. So I pulled out the details from there. So, what lessons can we learn from the Silk Road? Well, first of all, keep online identity separate. If he hadn't been posting his Altoid every single time, and also mentioning that Altoid is somehow connected to this Ross Elbrick Gmail account, and also the Ross Elbrick Gmail account's Google Plus account apparently has things uh, that mention that he has similar interests to the Dread Pirate Roberts, all these things, if he kept his identity separate, it would have helped. That means using different usernames and using different locations, since he also he connected to his Gmail from like, the same internet cafe where, he, uh, where someone was administrating the Silk Road from, eh, not very good um, operational security there. Also have a consistent story. I have to imagine it looked really weird to the Homeland Security people um, when he said that his name was Ross on his ID card, but all his buddies knew him as Josh. Um, or Joshua, whichever. And uh, don't talk about interests in general. If he'd not mentioned the things about the particular politics he was into, or even not mention it publicly, or only mention it in the darknet, you know, he would have been better off. Also, don't volunteer information. I have no idea why he mentioned the Silk Road at all and hypothetically being able to buy illegal things on it in his interview. That just seems nutty. Okay, technically I'm out of time, but I'm going to do demos anyway. Feel free to leave. I'm going to get these recorded. So, I mentioned some things you can do to de-anonymize people. Don't. Let's actually show some stuff. Here's um, a track doc. One thing you can do is you can make people contact you outside of the public internet, or over the public internet instead of a dark net. And one way to do that is depending on what they download from you. This is a little uh, doc X I created. And what it does is it has an embedded image inside of it. So let's say they visit it. Right now I'm using the Tor browser bundle. I'm going over Tor, but I'm visiting IronGeek.com. So I download this, and oh, it gives me a warning. And it probably will tell me it's not a good idea to open that. But um, let's go ahead and open it anyway. Because it's a Word doc. Maybe it has something in it that's interesting. So I open the Word doc. This is an image hosted on my website. And my version of Office still needs to be registered. You see the IP address is there. You see, hi there. And because they just visited my website, I can actually go and look and see what they did. So um, let me go. I have it up in one of my mini windows. Yeah, my log watch. If I was to refresh that, I should see a new connection. And I have information about what IP address connected to me. From there, I can do some who is and find out more details. I also have what browser they use, what operating system they use, and various other little details about the person. By the way, if you want a more professional version of this, Marcus J. Carey has a, a tool out there called HoneyDocs, which I have to log back into again because it has a short expiration period. Eh, I trust it. That's a... The change was rejected. I didn't want to change something. Okay, let me see if we can get back in. Documents, home, I think maybe I need to switch to a smaller screen. Things are definitely getting screwy here. So let me go back to the front page of HoneyDocs. All right. I'm always signed up.
Okay, I am now officially lost. This is really sad. Does anybody see a login that I'm missing? Sign in, you see it? Sign in? Oh, sign up. I don't want to sign up. I want to sign in. Oh, sign Sign in. I'm blind. Thank you. Okay, let's see if it let me in this time without... Can't type either. This is why I don't do live demos so often. Actually, not I think, but I do them way too often. All right. And a uh, new sting. All right, I hope we have a sting going. You know the, the zero hits. It's called Tor Test. Essentially, I create a document that I can download, and it's a zip file with a bunch of data in it. And his, like I said, is a more professional version of the same idea. Um, the only one on it that I could get to work on the Macintosh was the Excel file, but let's go ahead and download his version, and it's a little bit more refined. So this is credit card.zip. I can go ahead and download it. Download that file. Let's open it up and start looking at documents inside of it. Let's see, there's a credit card document. Okay, that's interesting. And that's going to warn me about that almost every single time. There's this Excel sheet, and it's linking off to something, although in this case the Excel sheet failed on... It failed here in Windows, but I've gotten it to work in OS X. And, you know, there's various other little docs like template files and so forth that all have things embedded in them that go talk to his site. So now if I go back here, I can uh, do a refresh, and I should see Buzz 4. So a few people have visited it. Let's go take a look. Okay, these are the documents they, they opened. The city was St. Charles, because it knows the IP address I am, and they could do a who is back to here. Latitude, longitude, I can click on one of these, I can find details about who visited it. So that is a Marcus J. Carey's more professional version of the thing I showed earlier. Please put a login thing at the very top header for me. That's Okay, that is one way of de-anonymizing. By the way, I have a few different things out there. If that Tor log didn't work, for some reason when I was vi vi using the, um, Word, my Word doc, I couldn't get it to work in OS X. However, if I did a search for any hits to this, so for some reason, the uh, Word on OS X would send this as a user agent string, but wouldn't actually download the image. No idea why. So it's still possible to get to contact you. Another thing you do if the remote site is exploitable, you can have some fun if you can find some kind of security problem with it. Now, by the way, these are the commands that would be equivalent if you were doing it on Linux. The last time I did this demo, I did it in Linux. This time I'm going to do it against a Windows server. So I have this um, Tor hidden service address. And it's running Mutilidae. Mutilidae is essentially um, a deliberately vulnerable website. It was originally started by me, but a guy named Jeremy Druin has done way, way, way more work on it than I am. He's a way better programmer than I was. But I started it off because I didn't like WebGoat because I thought it was not always clear what it wanted you to do. And I wanted something that was incredibly easy to exploit. And I also wanted something that was PHP based because that's what I developed in. So I found that writing a vulnerable PHP application was incredibly easy. But Jeremy's done way more work on it since. But we're going to use it. Let's say you have a remote execution vulnerability on your box. Well, there's ways you can use that to find the real IP address. Because right now, I'm contacting it over Tor. But let's say I was able to um, inject a command. Like, here's a DNS lookup uh, script. And let's hope it finds it. Let me double check to make sure that my service is still running. I'm actually running all these off of one machine. Oh, there we go. Right there, it asks me for a host name. So 8.8.8.8, .8 hostname or IP address. And basically what it does is it shells out to the command shell, and it runs something to figure out what that host is. But it's just executing directly something at the command shell. So let's say that parameter in there, I modified. So let's modify that a little bit. Instead, we could ping something. Like instead of just querying 8.8.8.8, .8 which is one of uh, Google's DNS servers, let's say we ping it. If I was 8.8.8.8, .8 I could be sniffing my traffic, and whoever was pinging me at that time must be who's actually running that remote server. Also, um, the fact that it gives me that tells me something. Now, right now, because everything is natted, that's like the IP address probably of the, I think, the first hop that's natted behind on my VMware. But in other cases, that would be its actual IP address. Another thing you can do is trace route. And right, trace route and ping are slightly different on Windows and Linux, so this is both versions of the commands. And so let me bring this up, and um, 
try doing that. So let me trace route. Ah, got the wrong one. I thought it. Did I not copy it right? There we go. We'll trace route. And that H is say only three hops. And the first hop you see should pretty much time you to what IP address it is. Or the very first, uh, the likely first node. At least get me way closer to the person. So here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. And eventually, because traceroute can take a little bit of time, it should return me some information. The best way is probably that ping I mentioned before, just have them contact you outside the darknet by issuing commands. Uh, or for instance, if you somehow got a password on the, on the box and you were able to uh, SSH someplace else, you can see where you're connecting from. But you know, right here, you can see that first hop. So we can tie that as a likely person to go talk to. Also, besides just that kind of injection, let's say we did a remote file includes could also be a way. I mean, there's tons of different ways, but let's do one via a remote file include, which um, I have an application on here that allows you to um, view code. So let me see. Ah, oh, yes, HTMI injection. Arbitrary file inclusion. I think that's one. Text file view, that's what I want. Yeah, Jason Scott has a bunch of text files on his website, so I made a little application where you can say, ooh, I want to view this particular file. How do I view it? Just select it from the box and view it. However, there's a bunch of problems with this because it has a remote file inclusion problem. So if we right click on this and do an inspect element, let's check out what URL is actually there. By the way, this is no special tools. This is just built into Firefox. You'll notice that it's accessing this text file and it's directly referenced in the HTML of the page. Probably a remote file inclusion problem. So let's include this little PHP script of mine that returns this is the IP address of who's accessing this PHP script. So I modify this. So instead of his URL there, I put in the one I want. And then I view file. And hopefully that works. It returns the IP address of who that is. Now in this case, I'm behind several NATs, and that's the I, like the public IP address of um, this particular hotel. But you get the general idea. It's no way of de-anonymizing people. Um, let me see if there's anything else on this list of things I wanted to show. That, that's pretty much it as far as um, uh, documents. Let me um, just go back to my slides. and uh, There's a bunch of other links I have out on my website if you're interested in darknets. Uh, I have a general talk on darknets that's like three hours long, if you can really stand to listen to me that long. Um, oh, actually, no, that first one is an older one that's not three hours long. I should have one in here someplace that actually is. There's a bunch of FAQs you can do. This is that workshop I did at school. It's like three hours long. We covered using both Tor and I2P. Uh, a lot of Tor notes I have, which lists a bunch of those um, projects of the NSA and so forth, just because I thought it was kind of interesting to research. I uh, also have stuff on like setting up hidden services. Just say a big, quick thing about DerbyCon. It's happening the 24th and tw the 28th of this year. Uh, though not all those days is the conference itself. The first few days is training. And there's a bunch of uh, conferences I can recommend listed down at the bottom. If you can make it out to them, they're a lot of fun. And uh, finally, are there any questions? Anything? Beulah? All righty. Well, I guess I'm done. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, buy me alcohol. <laughs>